professor in Department of Electrical Engineering, and I'm also the faculty coordinator for the Renew Power Center of Excellence at IIT Delhi. So uh, uh, my center has been around for about uh, five years now, and uh, uh, we are working um, on issues related to uh, energy, uh, sustainability, and climate change. And uh, it's a very successful center, and this is a new initiative started by the center, uh, a series of lectures that we will do over the next few years, uh, where we intend to invite um, eminent experts, uh, national as well as international experts, who are going to give um, us some uh, their words of wisdom on various issues surrounding energy and sustainability. So uh, the first speaker in this lecture series is our director, Professor Rangan Banerjee, who is uh, um, foremost expert in the domain of energy, internationally as well as nationally. And he's also, he happens to be the director of our institute, so we were very uh, fortunate to get him at very short notice. Um, so uh, we are also waiting for one of our um, uh, distinguished guests from Renew Power. So while we, uh, we are waiting, I invite the distinguished guests. I wish, uh, request Ashwini to welcome the distinguished guests, Professor Banerjee uh, to the podium, and uh, Professor P.V. Rao, Dean Planning, to the podium. So I uh, request uh, Professor Rao to come and uh, uh, make his opening remarks for this program today. Thank you, Nilanjan. Uh, good evening, everybody. So we have gathered here today to announce a new lecture series titled Energizing a Sustainable Future by one of our COEs, Renew Center of Excellence for Energy and Environment. Today we are honored to have Professor Rangan Banerjee, Director IIT Delhi as our first speaker for the series. His lecture is titled Unpacking India's Energy Transition redefining the research and education energy. On this occasion, I welcome our guests. Uh, in fact, uh, I think uh, Ms. Vaishali Nigam Sinha, Chief Sustainability Officer, Renew Power and will be there any time here. And our director, Professor Rangan Banerjee, and audience. I would like to say a few words about Renew Center of Excellence. The collaboration between IIT Delhi and industry partner Renew Power in the form of COE has been the perfect example of industry academia partnership. This is the very first COE of IIT Delhi, which was established in 2017. Some of the focused areas of research are battery integration, renewable energy integration, grid stability, urban pollution and renewable energy, renewable energy generation efficiency, resource, resource variability, etc. And if you see, for the last five years, the activities undertaken by COE, they are sponsorship of an award to encourage research in sustainability fields, Suman Sinha Sustainability Award, and it also supported six startups in the area of climate led by women entrepreneurs. This initiative is in collaboration with UNDP and FITT. 
each year the coe funds about 3 to 4 projects 14 students have been engaged and supported through the coe funds it also encourages industry academia partnership at iit delhi we are committed to do research that has direct tangible applications in industry and as well as to the society we want to strengthen our ties with industry as a step in the direction we have been organizing industry day this year we are hosting it fourth edition on 10th december 2022 without much ado i welcome ms vaishali sinha to deliver the opening remarks sir ma'am please Good evening, uh, everybody. It is an absolute pleasure uh, to be here today on the occasion of launching the IIT uh, Delhi Lecture Series. Uh, I think it's a great step. So a big round of applause for everybody who's behind this, the leadership team, the, all the professors, students, and of course, the Renew Power team as well. It's really, really a wonderful step in the right direction. Um, you know, I'd like to uh, thank uh, uh, the director, Professor Rangan Banerjee, for all his leadership, mentorship, support. Uh, without this, none of it is possible. And so uh, thank you, uh, Professor, for all your help um, in making uh, such initiatives possible, because it's all these initiatives which lead to the, you know, to all of us uh, getting engaged and um, also sensitization towards what must be done uh, in exemplary institutions like IIT. So, Really grateful for that. Uh, I'd like to also recognize that our engagement began under the guidance and support of uh, Professor Rao. And um, he encouraged us, uh, us a lot. And so from those beginnings to now, it has really been a journey we hadn't imagined. We hadn't planned for it. So to be where we are here is really delightful and very fulfilling for all of us to see that we are able to engage with all of you uh, I don't think all of you realize how, uh, how much respect you have in the world and how much we lean on you to find solutions. So to be able to work with all of you to find solutions in this area of the climate crisis we are facing around the world um, and identify specific, uh, specific uh, problems where we can find solutions in places like the Center of Excellence at IIT Delhi is uh, really what's going to get us there. So it, it's these building blocks which will eventually get us there uh, in India and even outside the world as well, because what we do here is definitely very useful for uh, various institutions outside as well. So once again, thank you to all of you. Uh, I'd also like to, um, you know, once again acknowledge the vision of everybody associated with the sector. And I do remember sitting in various rooms and meeting rooms, I thinking about what is it that we can do, what is it that we can find uh, useful, how can we be effective, how can we engage the students, how can we engage professors and engage them in the practical day-to-day -day issues so that we can combine research with what's going on in uh, industry and come up with real solutions, timely solutions, and at the same time work for the long run to identify solutions which may not be immediate, but we have to start working uh, towards those uh, issues ahead of time. So uh, the whole idea was, if I could say, in by using economics jargons, micro and macro, transactional and strategic. So with that in mind, uh, we have been doing whatever we have been doing. I also want to mention that uh, Sumanth, who is an alma mater of this institution, is extremely passionate, very grateful to whatever IIT uh, offered him, and which was a lot. Because at every step of the journey, I have been suffering or partnering in that journey for the last, I don't know, it's been 30 plus years. And any problem, um, you know, which we need to find solutions for, 
the first name he thinks of is, okay, let's get to the center, let's talk to IIT. So it's, it's really something which, um, which is a priority for us to uh, tap, to leverage what we can do, uh, not only as a part of this, uh, the center of excellence, actually, broadly speaking, in multiple areas, and a lot of that goes outside the center as well. So it's just tapping the sort of uh, uh, high intellectual quotient which resides in this institution and to engage uh, all of you in this whole journey of the energy transition which we are working towards in India. So, um, you know, just to give also some more backdrop for some of you who may not be aware, that, um, you know, the center of excellence, uh, uh, center of excellence, I believe, is the first center which was started here. And it happened a little accidentally, you know, it happened as a part of the Honorable President's uh, Visitors Conference, which is held at Rashtrapati Bhavan, and we were invited to uh, be a uh, signatory. So it was an idea without, uh, I guess, much thought on what would be um, uh, done as a part of the center. And I must say that sometimes that's the right way to start. And we started with the MOU, and then a lot of the MOUs, as all of us know, uh, remain MOUs. But all of us worked very hard to make sure that the MOU wasn't an MOU, and it was a definitive implementation plan. And that's something uh, which uh, uh, happened. I believe that the conversion rate is not very high. I think this is one of the um, a few um, uh, sort of uh, agreements which, uh, which uh, saw uh, light of the day, and, and, and I'm so glad that it did. And since then, of course, you know, we've been working on a lot of uh, areas of research, real uh, areas of research around air pollution, around, uh, you know, wind-related issues, you know, transmission-related issues, all of that, setting up the center of excellence, where will it be, how should it be, uh, were all matters of great excitement and joy. How do we shortlist students? Who do we interview, etc.? And then once we focused on the research and engaging uh, students, um, of course, COVID happened because of which we couldn't do a lot of the other stuff which was planned, which was things like going to the sites, getting a lot of the professors over to interact with the experts in our organization and in other industry uh, and regulatory institutions, which was critical. But uh, I think we will be ramping that up a little bit more. Um, thought leadership was always an important part of the sector, uh, of the center. So. It's nice to see this is happening. We've been having a few of these. But what's also been heartening is that we have uh, uh, also expanded this, um, as I heard, uh, to engage students. And the sustainability award, which is there, is something uh, which I know is there. But you know, like all awards, awards are awards. But uh, we just have to keep making them um, you know, uh, well, help achieve the purpose of an award. Why did we think about an award? The idea was to engage students to think about engaging in uh, you know, renewable energy, sustainability related uh, issues, and uh, any issue which they could identify problems, engage students, and come up with solutions to solve for it. Uh, if I could be honest, I think we can do a lot more. I know there's a lot being done, but uh, if we can build that sort of um, you know, this whole culture of, uh, you know, uh, extracurricular uh, curricular engagement. I know at IIT, all the dramatics and the music. I, I came for one of the festivals here. What's the festival uh, called? Rendezvous. Rendezvous, yeah. I was, I was in Hindu college, and I'd come for Rendezvous. And it was one of the coolest festivals, I think, in the universities in, in Delhi. But I think, uh, you know, similarly, we want to see that passion on uh, around this award, you know, and uh, we are living in a world, if you go around, that, uh, you know, just uh, young students uh, in school, in colleges, are quite driven by this issue. And so the question we must ask ourselves is, are we sensitized enough? Are our colleagues and our buddies around us sensitized enough? Can we do more to sensitize and find solutions with our brilliant minds? I think by far the best minds, I think, uh, present in institutions in the IITs. So if I would say that um, we are still moving in the right direction, but we can definitely do more uh, to ensure that it's not only about the award. The award was only um, a driver to do a lot more in the institution. Um, 
I think the other initiatives around the entrepreneurship program is really uh, something, uh, you know, which was again suggested by the leadership team at IIT that how, why don't we do more um, with respect to engaging women and entrepreneurship. So um, it's really uh, nice to see that you know, UNDP is quite involved. I meet a lot of uh, um, industry representatives and some of them are quite keen to get involved uh, to do more in various areas, whether it is recycling, whether it's sustainability, renewable energy. So I think we all, all of us are trying to push to make sure we can support entrepreneurs in a way where um, we have more women entrepreneurs. I know being a woman, I see it's almost, um, uh, you know, many times more difficult for women to either get mentorship or to get funds or for people to listen to their ideas uh, as, as um, you know, as fairly as I would say uh, men do. And I, that's a fact not only here, but in other parts of the world as well. So we should uh, do whatever we can to change that. And so this is a small way in which we are trying to do that. And I must say some of the projects which we've um, you know, kind of uh, seen and uh, listened to the plans. Uh, it's, uh, they are very impressive, and uh, so the goal remains to do more to ensure that uh, we can build this program, get more women engaged, get them funded, get them mentorship, and it's all about also meeting people who can provide various forms of support, technical, other for sorts of partnerships, perhaps forums where you can present your ideas and get connected. So um, I'm really looking uh, forward to uh, that as well. Uh, you know, I believe some of the entrepreneurs have got uh, government grants, etc. So, you know, steps in the right direction. So, um, yeah, so this is, um, yeah, this, I mean, I, I don't think I need to give any examples to, to talk about the relevance and the significance of uh, climate change. I think all of you are quite aware. I think we've seen individuals who've taken the lead once they believe in an idea where, you know, we've all heard the story where an individual saw certain snakes suffering and planted a forest and built an ecosystem and uh, created, um, you know, and sort of uh, almost a dreamlike biodiversity uh, ecosystem. And it was all done over many years by an individual who had entrepreneurship, who had the vision and the passion and the desire to bring about a change and contribute to that. So, you know, I think all of you sitting here have, and those listening, have a lot more than that. So let's go for it. And uh, all I want to say is that, you know, there are a lot of women who are there in different parts of our country who actually face problems of, you know, related to climate change in rural parts of our country. I think there are very few women in leadership uh, in policy making, uh, as business people, uh, perhaps more in academia than in any other area, but uh, we really do need women. And I can't tell you how keen the world is to have, um, you know, women engineers to get engaged in the fourth industrial revolution, which is also going to, uh, you know, find problems, not only in the area of climate change, but various other areas. So uh, a special shout out for all the women in this room, and I see quite a few of them. Uh, to do as much as you can to get engaged. And it doesn't really mean to go on a site and work or do, uh, you know, things which are very challenging, but it's, it's all about research. It's about getting involved in regular roles and jobs in companies like ours and many others, or even financial institutions. But I think there is a lot more sensitization um, uh, with respect to, um, uh, you know, what... Uh, uh, you know, I, I think we need to create a lot more sensitization uh, about the fact that women are suffering the most. So let's engage them to find solutions because they, once you are going through a problem, you're in a better position to find solutions for those problems as well. So on that note, I want to um, thank uh, the institution for this opportunity. And um, uh, just once again, um, Professor Banerjee, I think... Uh, Great step in the right direction. I'd like you to um, uh, please uh, come and say a few words uh, and unpack the plethora of ideas this lecture series is likely to uh, launch in the coming uh, uh, days, weeks, and months. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> 
So uh, we come to the main item of our uh, program, which is the lecture by Professor Rangan Banerjee. So I would like to uh, give a short introduction to uh, Professor Banerjee. So Professor Rangan Banerjee is a professor in the Department of uh, Energy Science and Engineering at IIT Delhi. Of course, he is the director of IIT Delhi also. Uh, till February 2022, he was the Forbes Marshall Chair Professor in the Department of Energy Science and Engineering at IIT Bombay, uh, a department that he helped to start in 2007. His areas of interest include energy management, modeling of energy systems, energy planning and policy, hydrogen energy and fuel cells. Professor Banerjee has been involved in setting up a megawatt scale solar thermal power testing simulation research facility sponsored by the Ministry of New and Renewable Energy. He is the faculty advisor for Team Shunya, India's first student team in Solar Decathlon Europe, China and US finals. He has been involved in advising the city, state regulatory commission and energy agency, Niti Aayog planning commission MNRE on various energy issues. Professor Banerjee is an adjunct professor, honorary adjunct professor at the Department of Engineering and Public Policy, Carnegie Mellon University. Uh, he is also a fellow of the Indian National Academy of Engineering. So I uh, request Professor Banerjee to start his lecture. So I'd like to first of all thank Professor Sandroy and Renew Power. I hope I've been asked to invited here not as director but because I know something about energy. And uh, it's a welcome change for me rather than being in inaugurations where it's mostly a public relations kind of exercise where I have to welcome someone or invite someone. Uh, so I am going to, how many of you here, how many students, I think it's mostly faculty as I see. How many students here, could you raise your hand? Oh, that's a reasonable amount of students, great. So I am going to, uh, in the next half an hour or so, do three things. One is I am going to give you a quick overview of what I understand, a perspective on India's energy transition, what it means. And for many of you, this may be actually quite, uh, it's like very basic things, but it will give you a perspective on what we are today in India in terms of the energy situation, what we were and what is likely to be the transition. What does that imply in terms of people in education and research? And in this, I have tried to compile what we are doing. I've left out all the things I used to do at IIT Bombay and whatever IIT Bombay does in energy, but we have tried to compile what we are doing here at IIT Delhi and it's a large amount. So everything is not going to be in that. I'm going to quickly go through that and then come to the end to try and put a perspective of what is really needed and how we can take this all together and hopefully then we'll have some time for question answers. So that's the way in which we plan. I'm going to start by defining what do we understand by a t energy transition. And you know, if you see, there are many different definitions of transitions, but basically it, it's a particularly significant set of changes to the patterns of energy use in society. And if you can look at, look at your own life and see what happens when you, when you don't have electricity or when you don't have cooking fuel. Right? So basically when you look at an energy infrastructure, it's not just a technical system, it's a socio-technical system and a system transition in this system creates a substantial change in the entire society and that is why we need to be bothered about the energy transition. The Germans called it energy wende and you can see there are a number of different, you need to share the screen, yeah, go ahead. So let's do, let's just see a very simple question. Now, 
we all know that we are all increasing the share of renewables. So, I wanted to ask you in the power sector, in the electricity generation during the last 40 years in India, what do you think the share of renewables in the electricity sector in India has more than doubled from its earlier value, remained almost constant, decreased significantly? Can I go back to the slide? Increased by 10 percent or none of the above. So, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, look at all the options and then we will ask. Let me see how many think, how many for 1? Okay, I count about 8, 9, more than doubled. Has remained almost constant? I have a suspicion most people are sitting on the fence. <laughs> has decreased significantly. Okay, there is one person thinking decreased significantly, increased by 10 percent. Okay, that is the majority view, none of the above. Okay, in these things as you well know, you know, taking a vote is not the right, necessarily the right way to get the right answer. So, the answer actually has that it has decreased significantly. And that that is one of the things which you must understand is when we think in terms of renewables, we usually exclude large hydro. And if you include large hydro, we will see the data. So, this is a tri plot, it shows you the trajectory which we had in the 90 in the 70s, we had essentially almost with the large hydro power, it had 45, 50 percent, 40, 40 plus percent of electricity supply, total generation from hydro. We moved in this line where you see, we moved in the direction where we increase thermal and the hydro share has actually declined, nuclear remaining almost constant. Now, we we are moving back along that line and that is the trajectory that we have had. We can move in two ways, we can move down this line with nuclear remaining constant or we can go for a high nuclear scenario. So, that is the challenge to move back and to move back even beyond that and go forward to the targets that we have in 2030 and others. And already we have created this infrastructure which is based on thermal and based on hydro and large centralized. So, what have been the transitions in the past? The first transition that we have made is, we have made the transition from traditional fuels to modern commercial fuels, mainly fossil. And whether you look at the electricity sector or you look at the total sector, we are today predominantly driven by fossil fuels like most countries in the world. We have also made significant investments in centralized energy supply and we have been successful in connecting up the entire country to a large centralized grid. We have had a large centralized supply and distribution uh, infrastructure. We have had large hydro and coal based thermal power plants. The focus has always been on providing supply so that people have uh, energy and electricity. Most of this had been on public sector and government investments. Now, the in the what has changed is that we have had what are the drivers for the new transition. The first and most important driver is climate change and I am sure all of you are quite aware of it and we will talk a little bit about it. We have made all countries voluntarily made commitments and we made a commitment in Paris and there is a global move away from fossil. In COP 26, the prime minister has made additional commitments and so we have quite an ambitious set of targets, we will talk about that. This has also been accompanied by significant drop in the prices of solar PV and wind. And this has been based on technology developments. We have seen reductions in prices of shale oil and natural gas. So, the US has become a net exporter of energy. We in our country have had suc success in public procurement on E through ESL. I will show you for instance, if you look at LEDs, rapid decline in prices. There has also been a significant development in terms of internet of things, technology development, internet intelligent sensors controls which we should think would re result in decentralized energy systems, but that has not happened. Um, so, just to quickly look through for those of you who would like to see, 
this is one paper, it's an old paper, 2019 in Nature, uh, Johan Rockström talked about the planetary boundaries, looking at the earth as a system and seeing how can you keep this system under control. So, the, uh, the this paper looks at a large number of different parameters and identified a set of parameters which are critical for the earth to remain in stable operation. And there were nine parameters and in each of these they documented the pre-industrial levels of the natural equilibrium. And so, we, on three points the earth is already facing problems, climate change, the nitrogen cycle and the rate of biodiversity loss. And you can see this, typically it is only in the last 3000 years or so that we have had relatively stable temperatures on this earth and because of that we have had the evolution of life and this of course that is called the Holocene. This is being threatened by the fact that it is now human generated change which is called the Anthropocene and you can see that this is a record of you know you can see this is all ice core data about 800 years you can see some fluctuations above an equilibrium line of about 280 parts per million by volume of CO2 and then after that you have a different one which is like a exponential growth which is basically the growth which is related to anything which is related to human activity and consumption there is an exponential growth and you can see. So, this is essentially when you link this up with the fact that CO2 is a, a greenhouse gas and then you have a temperature, uh, you have the link with temperature, then you have the, pro this is basically you can look at this in any of the IPCC reports. This is the evidence of uh, the fact that we are having climate change. Similar, that is ice core data, similar data which is coming from an observatory and you can see we are already crossed 400 parts per million. So, in doing this, so basically what has happened is that if you look at, uh, let me just start with. Yeah, so let let us go to, in Paris we made a commitment and you can see this is the um, star, uh, this is the initiation with a Sanskrit slok the saying that we would like to be one with nature and uh, we have made a commitment to reduce the emission intensity of our GDP by about one third, create 40 percent cumulative non-fossil power. Um, by uh, installed capacity and create an additional carbon sink. So, we have made ambitious, we have made, we have been successful in doing, uh, in aggressively going ahead with solar PV and wind. And you can see this, uh, sorry, let me go back. So, you can see we started off with uh, guaranteeing a price of about, it was about 12 rupees and we did, we uh, had reverse bidding and now you can see with time basically we are now at 2 rupees to 3 rupees per kilowatt hour. This is, a, this, is this was actually we have been successful in driving down prices much more than many other countries in the world and this was one of our success stories in terms of policy in the EESL LED lamps started off with 1200 rupees per lamp gone down to 34 rupees per lamp. So, in our transition what are the elements of the energy transition? The first is the electricity sector transition, we are going to change look at a supply mix where we are going to have, we are moving away from fossil to renewables, we are also looking at efficiency. In the transport sector moving away from oil, multiple things possible, CNG and then eventually we are going to, we are already going into electric and it is hydrogen or biofuel or many others. Air travel is an issue and uh, we have to see what are the kind of technologies for that. Reducing the demand for travel, we have been forced to do that in, during COVID and uh, hopefully some of that sort of rubs out into our overall uh, requirement for travel. Cooking energy, we are making the transition from biomass to LPG for health reasons and for convenience reasons, but we need to see whether when we want to go to decarbonize that, whether we go to electricity or modern biomass or any other source. Buildings, we can have each building actually generate its own energy and then supply. So, the idea is net zero or energy plus buildings. 
industries can become low carbon or zero carbon. So these are all elements and all of these involve technology, development, making it cost effective, looking at it without affecting the way in which we, as we go through the transition, we do not want to create hardship. So that's the, and then of course we can, so, so as I told you, we have the, sorry, I went back. So this was the Paris commitment. And in uh, Glasgow, we may, we enhanced that. We said we will do 500 gigawatt of non-fossil power installed capacity by 2030. By 2030, 50 percent of our energy mix would be renewables, reduction of 1 billion tons of CO2 emissions and emission intensity from one third. We are saying now it will go to 45 percent. And also we, uh, we said we will do a net zero carbon dioxide target by 2070. So if you look at India and compared to the world, this is for 2019, you'll see that we are about one-sixth of the world's population. That means we are about 17, 18 percent of the world's population, but we consume six to seven percent of the world's energy. Of course, our GDP per capita is also lower than the world's average, but typically because of this, our CO2 footprint is also lower than the world's average. We are now about 1.7 tons per capita. And these are some of the things. Uh, if you look at this is a s energy balance diagram, you'll see that we predominantly, we are the main source of energy is coal, followed by oil, and most of our oil is imported. When you look at the usage of energy, of course, it's uh, residential, industry, and a lot of the uh, oil is going into the transport sector. And so you can see, well, a significant proportion of our energy is used for the electricity sector and then this is sort of, uh, you can also see that this plot shows over time how we, uh, we have actually um, the share of renewable by capacity and the share of renewables by generation. So remember these shares are different because the because of the capacity factor that means if you look at the sun it is only available for particular hours of the day and so if you look at the 24 hour time period so though we are more than 20 percent by uh, by installed capacity by generation now we have crossed 10 percent 10 11 percent and there we can also look at this is called the mckinsey abatement curve you can see that from today to the future, if you had business as usual, you'll have a certain amount of CO2 emission. Then you can look at all the options which are available to us and for each technology we can identify how much we can save and what is the cost and you can stack it up and you can see, so you do the cheaper ones first and then move ahead. Most of the cheaper ones are the energy efficiency ones and then you go ahead. So this is a CO2. Now we've, you've heard about this term net zero, net zero means different things to different people and one way we can talk about net zero considering only carbon, that means we are only looking at CO2, net zero considering all greenhouse gases and this is on an annual basis, net zero also considering imports and exports and then net zero considering cumulative emissions because the CO2 which we emit stays for a lo long period of time, so based on this. So accordingly, people have do done these calculations. Now this is just to show you some scenarios of how we can go to 2070. What we have here is that this is the historical trajectory. If we project it, this is how it would go. Now we've already made, if you look at the growth rate in the last few, few years, we've already made some reduction. So if you take that growth rate, this is how it would go. We, we, with the kind of policies that we have, the idea is to go towards a peaking in about this time and then go to net zero in 2070. So that's the idea. There are many issues related to going towards this net zero. Um, one of the main issues is that the nature of the supply that we are going to have is completely different. If there's a need for storage and flexibility there's also climate change impact on renewables and then there's an impact on the economy. There is uh, standard assets, the coal plants that we have installed, existing investments in the fossil infrastructure, there's a cost of transition, there are regional differences, there are impact on vulnerable populations and there's an equity impact. 
So just to give you a quick idea, I'll just show you a simple kind of analysis that we had done to look at a future scenario. If you look at a 2040 and you see the final demand and we have most of a significant amount of solar coming in, the remaining demand which has to be met, which is going to be, is after you remove solar and wind, you, it sort of ramps down during the, as sun, solar comes up and then it will have to ramp up as the solar phases out. And then we have to, this is what the remaining uh, infrastructure, power infrastructure has to create. Uh, we can fill it in different ways and basically what happens is as you start going higher and higher shares of solar or renewable, there will be a point where every additional unit that we are supplying during the daytime has to be used at some other time, which means that there will be a storage requirement. And this will of course add to the cost. Uh, and so this is already can be seen that though you are having a fixed price, many distribution companies are not willing to take off take the solar because they know that then that would be surplus at certain hours. So this is one issue which people are of course working on. The other issue which is not thought about is that we've been very successful in our solar mission, right? But when we started the solar mission, we were actually a net importer of solar cells and modules. And we thought that as we went ahead, what you find is we are, now if you look at this color, this is showing net exports and this is imports, 84, 86%. So we've, we are now a net importer of solar cells and modules and the total amount is quite significant. Of course, the government, we have realized this and now we have the incentive scheme to encourage people to, but we basically missed the opportunity that we have to have our own technology and our own cells and modules. And this is something which might even happen in the case of batteries and storage. And that's the challenge for all of us, okay? Another thing is the solar comes in Rajasthan, in Gujarat, in the south. Most of the, it's replacing coal and fossil, which is more in Chhattisgarh and east. So then there is a regional difference. And we did some calculations of this in terms of, yes, there are net, Jobs are created, but then jobs are also lost. And the jobs are created in a particular region, which doesn't offset the jobs which are lost in another region. So it's another interesting thing. Okay, now we switch tracks, and we are going to, I'm going to talk to you, uh, sorry. I'm going to talk to you now about, so we've talked about the transition, and what are the issues in the transition? The energy systems in the future will look quite different from the energy systems today. So this obviously means a different kind of curriculum, a different kind of education. And I, we at IIT Delhi are quite, uh, we are actually equipped and we have a number of programs in this. We have the Department of Energy Science and Engineering with a PhD program, MTech programs in Energy Studies, Energy Environmental Technology Management. An interesting program is a program which is an international program. The only MTech, international MTech program uh, in IIT Delhi and probably amongst the IITs where we have 20 people from across the world um, uh, and funded by the International Solar Alliance on Renewable Energy Technologies and Management. We have also a BTEC program and it started a couple of years back. We, in the electrical engineering also there are several uh, MTEC programs in related areas, power systems, power electronics, machines and drives. In CART we have a unique MTech program on electric mobility. Again, one of the few uh, such programs uh, anywhere in uh, India. In uh, the thermal engineering in mechanical also deals with many energy issues. Center for Atmospheric Sciences, the MTech program also relates with climate and atmosphere and energy issues. In School of Public Policy, some of the students in the masters also deal with energy and climate. So we are actually Across the board, we have many different educational offerings. We have many minors and also through our CEP, QIP, we have the Evidya. Again, this is something where we need to discuss and when we look at our curriculum review to see how this can, how we need to change the curriculum related to this. Now what I'm going to go through is very quickly give you glimpses of research done by all faculty colleagues and, like, and we have sort of compiled this from various things. So we'll start with, we have, this is a technology where we have some level of concentration and portable 
um, PV towers for uh, power generation, smaller scale. We have the ability to make uh, solar cells and with reasonable kinds of efficiencies, 18% efficiency uh, and at, at reasonable size. And we have this entire PCVD system and the labs which give you that. We, may, we have some work on uh, solar thermal and parabolic trough concentrators. Uh, and in that, we are also looking at parabolic trough concentrators usually are used to do you know, heat transfer oils, but here we can do direct steam generation also. There's a test facility here. Um, along with this, one of the issues that we talked of is storage. One of the biggest advantages of solar thermal is you can integrate it with liquid. And so we are looking at thermal energy storage. Again, there are some test facilities at reasonable scale, not, not completely in scale. Uh, we have integration of PV, solar PV and solar thermal and uh, uh, latent uh, storage. Now, when we look at batteries, we have different groups and different faculty members in the departments who are working on lithium ion batteries, going from material to pack level and the testing, simulation as well as the entire assembled cell. Uh, we have also a project on sol sodium sulfur battery. I, th I believe one part of this with Renew Power, uh, with the Renew Center. The first part is to look at pouch cell development, and the next part is to actually go for higher volume sodium sulfur batteries. Uh, vanadium redox batteries, again, a very interesting kind of <coughs> flow batteries, which which can also take care of seasonal, and uh, this is something which. We have demonstrators just outside this hall. You can see that. And uh, so then there are innovations at each stage, whether it's the electrolyte, the electrodes, and the separators. And, and this is something which I hope we will see this is scaling. Um, we have a center for an energy storage platform on batteries. And you can see looking at this and, and also looking at uh, charging stations. Um, <coughs> we have. When we talk of storage, we have uh, integration of phase change material which, uh, with buildings and building simulation and looking at uh, linking it up and looking at passive uh, techniques for air improved air conditioning, thermal energy storage for buildings. Again, this is something where, where our faculty colleagues are working on. Uh, different types of um, modifications in air conditioning systems with uh, desiccants and so that the overall energy requirement gets reduced. Um, on the grid side, again, I'm showing you a few things, but there's much more there. Um, we work on all aspects of it, generation, transmission, distribution, as well as the policies, uh, looking at the kind of uh, our faculty colleagues have been involved in actually making white papers for, for the uh, different uh, electricity sector org um, organizations, uh, DSO implementation, uh, various Microgrids are available, both emulators, actual grid, uh, microgrid simulators, the, the hardware, all of this is available and there are multiple such with different faculty members. Um, also looking at demand side management, looking at control and switching on and off loads, looking at uh, operation, efficient operation and again many of these are where it is done at the lab scale and you can have also demonstrators. So these are, we have smart retrofitting prototypes. On the electric vehicles, I believe we have the entire facility, um, which is where we can uh, test cells, we can test full stacks, and we can also look at the entire uh, vehicle itself. And we have the power electronics related to um, electric vehicles. So we actually have on the campus significant expertise and we are to actually make help make a good impact in this. We have the chargers which have been done. Um, we have uh, <coughs> work on looking at biogas production, uh, pyrolysis and liquids, and also looking at uh, efficient bio cook stoves and uh, heating systems. Um, some of our colleagues have also been working on small industry and a rural industry, rural kilns and furnaces, doing audits, looking at efficiency improvements, waste heat recovery systems, and furnace improvements. Uh, we've been uh, the plasma group has been involved in 
create looking at plasmas from waste to energy. Um, this is an interesting uh, project because this is a tripartite project with Thermax, IIT Delhi as well as DST and the idea and it is a complete plant, it is a 1 ton per day coal to methanol plant and the idea is to scale this and to also integrate it with carbon capture and storage and uh, this is, is uh, you know the, the idea is to and so in all of this there are there is a gasification catalysis there are whole different kinds of things all coming together and then the idea is to take this forward and move it to scale and th this is the sort of PFD and control uh, schematics of that particular system. Uh, we have also in the case of vehicles, we, uh, the demonstrators of a three wheeler um, uh, of running on hydrogen, dimethyl ether, uh, DME based fuels with flexibility. This is something still at the lab scale, but if you have the sulfur iodine thermochemical cycle, you can actually uh, use this and you can generate hydrogen uh, in a uh, renewable fashion. Uh, we've had a hydrogen fuel generator again, this is with Kirloskar. Um, so this is all, many of these things were in terms of energy. We are also looking at the air quality problem and so local and global uh, and in this, in air quality, we are looking at uh, source apportionment, controlling, modeling, looking at air quality and uh, again the variety of things, this would need another uh, lecture to talk about all the details, but we have had several kinds of innovations in this uh, domain. Um, there have been also studies of aerosol impact climate change impact on renewables on uh, the solar and wind and the performance and this is important when we think in terms of large scale solar and wind coming in and seeing that we are able to in real time forecast things. Uh, the idea the, uh, the uh, atmospheric sciences CAS is actually thinking in terms of having much better and more accurate uh, local prediction of uh, meteorological parameters which will enable us to actually see that the uncertainty in the uh, PV and wind and renewables can be decreased. Um, there are policy based studies on basic, basically the uh, um, pricing on uh, what happens to coal as we go along in the transition mismatch of coal and renewables, we talked about that again there are studies related to this. We are talking of green hydrogen, where does green hydrogen come from, how, would, how much would it cost under what conditions and, and, and so those, these are again things which some of our colleagues have been working on. Uh, the viability of decentralized versus centralized again are uh, sort of, we are also looking at the campus as a demonstrator and we hope to make the ne uh, campus a net zero cap uh, campus and the idea is to look at uh, what is the carbon emissions today, actually calculate it, dig, uh, do audit and then look at a pathway to net zero. And we have already done some things in terms of uh, installing 2.7 megawatt of uh, P solar PV, also to taking some of our electricity from hydro um, and uh, we, so there are many more other things, we have, we have e-mobility also on campus, waste management uh, and the idea is to move towards, uh, essentially go to a target where we go towards setting up a net zero target and, and then monitoring and tracking how it goes. So there are, in summing up, we talked about the energy transition, the challenges of the energy transition. And uh, in me looking at those challenges, there are many different things that we can think of. And one of the things which is required as we saw in the case of PV is that we have a large market, we have a large demand, whatever we create, whether it is uh, storage, whether it is PV, uh, if we can create competitive technology which can capture that space then it will also help our economy. So one of the things that we think in terms of is technology improvements, cost reductions to see that our industry is cost competitive, whether it is the different components, the balance of systems or actually the renewables 
we think in terms of storage, we think in terms of control, we also need to think in terms of resilience and redundancy because of the flexibility and the fluctuations which are going to happen with the new systems. We will also need to look at improved operations and this is where modeling, simulation, control, optimal control, we can also think in terms of you know many people working on uh, re re nanomaterials, designer materials, uh, redesign the products and systems. Uh, and so there are a whole host of then studies related to policy, what is likely to happen, we are going to make this large transition on this system, what are going to be the impacts, who is going to be, what happens to vulnerable um, populations. So there are a whole host of challenges and opportunities for researchers. And we need to actually at IIT Delhi take the lead in defining some of this working together with industry, creating, seeing that today we are able to make a prototype. At most we can take that prototype, we can start with an incubation, but we have limitations in scaling. And this is where we need to find new ways in terms of partnerships. The energy, climate and sustainability space is a space where there are going to be many changes going forward. This has lot of challenges and this has lot of opportunities. This is something where we as an institute can really make a mark and really make an impact. And uh, so just to summarize, we are, yeah, so we want to put campus as a demonstrator, we provide competitive advantage for Indian industry, we want to provide the leadership in detailing the research and the education agenda. We of course have a new curriculum and so Thank you so much for patiently listening to me. I'm not sure, I think I exceeded my time a bit, but <laughs> I'll be happy to, if there is time to answer a few questions. Oh, you have the mic. If you have a question, just raise your hand. Hello. Yeah, thanks for the talk and I just have a question on the carbon, uh, sorry, the coal, coal power. Uh, you said that the net uh, share of the renewables has decreased and the reason I believe is that the demand is increasing. So the new uh, coal plants and the gas plants are coming up and that's why the percentage share of the renewables is less. So what about the f focus on the improving the efficiency of existing thermal power plants? So I think two, two parts of the question. One is that uh, what I was saying is over a 40 year time horizon, uh, the share of thermal had increased. Mm -hmm. But uh, the fact is in the last 10 years, last decade or even more than that, we are the, the share of renewables is, see the share of hydro has been declining and uh, the share of renewables is increasing. So the share of coal is actually going down. Okay. Um, but over a long period of time, over a 40 year time period, the share of coal had been increasing. Yeah, so increase. now coal is going to decline, but yes, uh, the, there is a possibility of improving the, uh, increasing the efficiency of the thermal power plants. It's not a very large proportion, okay. but there is a possibility and uh, all the new plants which were built in the last a decade or so, many of them were uh, supercritical and ultra supercritical. So those those have higher efficiencies. Uh, the other issue is that what is happening with many coal power plants is because they are not being dispatched because renewables initially were must runs. So what happens is when if you have high renewables, the coal is being backed down. So they are operating at part loads. Yeah. So many of the coal plants are actually um, losing money. And because of that, they are become, becoming standard assets and they have, we, we paid for them 
right? So there are loans, those are usually loans taken by public sector banks. So someone, finally someone has to pay for it. But eventually what happens is coal is going to be phased out and the share will decrease, um, but it will still in the next 10, 20 years we are still going to have a significant amount of coal. So you are right, we need to see how to use the coal efficiently. We are also trying to see how to operate the coal plants more flexibly. So earlier what happens is so you can go down even lower. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, sir, at the at, at the last you mentioned that uh, as an institute we can we can build prototypes and uh, can have something in research, but you said that the problem comes in scaling in scaling that. So what 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 can be done so as to implement it properly amongst the whole population? So I think one of the things is you know the model like we have with Renew Power, mm -hmm. where we are working with industry. Actually, all the projects that are happening are industry and academia working together and uh, we are also have the now the research and innovation park we expect some of our large partners to actually have their r d center here where industry is looking at scaling and also is willing to invest and think of you know working together we can't give you a product tomorrow but if you say two to three years yes we can so, so that is the way in which we can identify and then see that. So it is something like industry, government, we have to create those ecosystems. They are happening, they are increasing, the in ecosystems are improving, but still it is a gap, right? So there are many things where you can have startups and you can do, you know, some parts of it. But for some of the large equipment, for instance, it, this methanol and if we can make it, uh, we, we need to have an industry like Thermax or an LNT or something and, and work through it. So it's, uh, it, it's an ongoing thing, yeah. And sir, so in continuation with that, uh, in, in this tran energy transition, what will, what, what may happen if a new technology comes and, and the old, old existing, uh, old existing things, then they need to be replaced. So is that an, is that also an issue? That is an issue, what we call, you know, in this term, it's all usually called lock-in because what happens is you've already bought something, you'll wait till the end of life to do that, otherwise you just dispose of it. For instance, we have a coal plant, we've invested in it, it's got still a residual life, should we use it or not, should we keep the coal underground? So that it's always, finally, in all of this, we need to understand that costs matter. And when we are making that investment, it does have an impact because it's, uh, it affects the economy. So no, no easy answer to that question. Shall we do one thing? We'll, in the interest of time, can we just, whoever wants to ask questions, can you just, let's ask all the questions, I'll answer all together at the end. So we take two, three uh, questions, whatever. Yeah, actually. Because I think your time, just, yeah. No, no, I'm not uh, closing. Mm. Actually, Mr. Suman Sina has joined online and he okay. wanted to say a few words in response to whatever uh, okay. the, the lecture. So uh, can we unmute him and uh, maybe he can join? <coughs> Suravi, yeah. is he on the line? Yeah. yeah. Yes, yes, I'm here. Yes, yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, we can hear you, please. Yes, yes. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. I'm sorry uh, I got delayed, Professor Banerjee, because I was in a meeting that somebody came up. But I, I fortunately, I, uh, I had the pleasure of being able to listen to your presentation. Um, and it was extremely interesting because you went into a lot of different areas. You sort of covered the macro of the uh, uh, energy transition in terms of how the grid management, the duck curve, all of those kinds of issues you talked about. And you also talked about the micro of all the different technologies that are coming up. And so uh, from that standpoint, it was very interesting because, uh, you know, very often we tend to look only at the macro issues and we tend to miss out on all the actual underlying technology work that is going on. And I think that was, uh, that was for me actually the most, uh, one of the most interesting uh, facets of what you presented, but you presented a very broad sweep of, of different areas. Um, the point that I wanted to make is that, uh, you know, in this whole area, uh, I think one of the things where India needs to uh, really move forward much faster is the area of technology development uh, and being able to get that technology to the market quickly. I think uh, we have to move it from the labs into the field 
as rapidly as possible and really shorten that cycle time. And that is really where I think we need to have much closer uh, working between uh, uh, institutes like IIT Delhi and corporates like Renew uh, in figuring out how we take the technologies, move forward the ones that we feel can have commercial application quickly and really move them forward much faster. I think that's a very important thing that we should think about. And I think that is really also an area where a lot of the students at IIT can play a big role because uh, they obviously understand uh, technology. They're also obviously extremely smart and uh, they can also understand the commercialization of these technologies along with, uh, along with of course, the uh, professors at IIT Delhi. So these are the things that we really need to uh, focus on quite a bit. Uh, to my mind, the whole energy transition, as you stated, is one of the biggest opportunities over the next uh, two, three decades um, uh, you know, uh, that we're looking at from an economic standpoint. It's also one of the most important things that uh, we need to focus on because of the climate change imperative and so on. So I think it's, it's really, really critical that we all get it right. And one of the very interesting slides, um, uh, Professor Banerjee, you had showed was our import dependence. Uh, and that is something that we definitely need to look at very seriously. And that is why along with technology development, we also need massive new manufacturing capacities uh, and make sure that India really emerges as a country that can capitalize on this whole uh, emerging uh, supply chain opportunity from a global standpoint, not just for India. And again, from that standpoint also, we need uh, technology to move into uh, application very quickly. And we also, of course, need uh, supportive uh, regulatory and uh, public policy. That is equally important. And uh, the one other area, of course, is uh, financing, which, of course, we can talk about at some later point in time. But, uh, but thank you so much for your presentation. It was, it was extremely insightful, interesting. And the way you presented the photographs of the laboratories where the work is actually going on, you know, it's so interesting to see that actually happening because, you know, we usually tend to see the the end product of some of these deployments are then the actual development of these technologies when they happen actually inside laboratories. So that is that is really quite thank interesting you. as well. Thank, thank, thank you. you thank you, Mr. Sina. Please go ahead. You had a question. Yeah. yeah. yeah so, uh, Professor Banerjee, uh, uh, the cheapest uh, electricity in Europe uh, is uh, is uh, is in uh, France, and bulk of that is produced via nuclear energy. Isn't that a direction that, uh, I mean, scaling up nuclear energy would be relatively easier than scaling up solar or wind energy. Why are we not uh, moving, uh, also trying to capture that sector? Uh, private sector, uh, yeah, industry will, uh, most probably we won't have private nuclear power plants, but uh, shouldn't government be interested in uh, going in uh, that direction? Yeah, well, I, I did say we'll take a number of questions, but I'll answer it straight away. Uh, the Nuclear Power Corporation and the DAE, uh, the maximum target they are looking at is something like 60,000 megawatts in a time period, which is not ambitious enough. And uh, we had this conversation with Dr. Kakotkar, who really believes a very high nuclear scenario should be there. We did some numbers, it's possible. Uh, my personal take on this is that while it is possible, you know, nuclear is a very, if there is a problem in nuclear, it's a low probability event. But the cost of that damage is a very high probability. And because of that, the popular acceptance of nuclear, if we say, okay, Hoskas is not a place where you can put, there's no space, if we don't have a space for a building also. But if you, even in most areas, if you think of the nuclear power plant, there is always, we've seen whether it is in Jaitapur or in, so I don't see that you are going to really make, you know, we can go to 60,007, uh, we can go to, a, unless they're talking of now the technology changes where you're looking at, you know, ultra safe, uh, ultra safe low, uh, you know, uh, small size nuclear reactors. So in my opinion, technically, yes, it's possible. And also if you look at whether it's uh, US or France, uh, they are not adding new nuclear generators. 
So this is all past and the, those costs have been and actually the uh, unlike in PV where you see the learning curve in nuclear the cost of new generators has actually gone up because the restrictions and the controls have become more and more. So yes technically yes but it is a societal choice and um, it is a possibility uh, we have to look at it but in my mind uh, it is unlikely to happen of course we could have a breakthrough in uh, you know we have done uh, the with thorium we have created a test reactor but it is not gone to the next level. So we have to wait and see how that is going but my opinion is that probably not not going to scale very significantly it is going to be in the 4, 5, 6, 10 percent level not more than that. But it is a it is you know someone can have a different you can create a scenario we have created a scenario and we have shown 260, 270 gigawatt and you can see the whole thing because it is dispatchable. So the base load which you in thermal what do you replace it with nuclear could be a replacement. It's still off. Yeah, no. Yeah, the question was similar actually because I was talking about uh, triangle that you have shown where you could have got yeah. two roots. Uh, I agree there is a problem with the issue, there is a catastrophe, it is going to be a deadly catastrophe. But on the same lines, uh, like France is not investing, but they are investing in fusion reactors, right? So is there a possibility you feel that if in the next 10 years if so that, that could change of thought in nuclear? So in, in the fusion, it is a global, uh, yeah, I mean all entire, so we have to wait and see for that. Right. Uh, and as I said, I am not, say, I'm not ruling it out, I am just saying it is a societal choice. Right. And uh, it is also a question of not just technology, but it is perception. It is the perception of the technology which matters. Okay. So, but so one more question in this regard, uh, renewables, do you think that can be 100%? Uh, oh yes, of course it can be. It, uh, uh, it can be technically for anything we can make it 100%. The whole issue is about costs, right? right? So there will be costs of storage, there will be, we already have a set of systems in the short run when we make the transition, it is going to be hybrid. And mm -hmm. then in that it is going to be the, the cost and uh, will dictate. So okay. it can always, technically we can create a 100% re, renewable solution for anything. But then we will have to build in storage, we will have to build in controls. Mm -hmm. And uh, so the final thing is today if you see all our electricity, all our distribution companies, the debt or the losses which are there, right? Uh, there in uh, we are talking of I, I don't remember the number but it is a very significant uh, number of uh, we are talking of a uh, very significant amount of accumulated uh, losses. And so which means that we are not actually paying for the electricity that we generate and uh, we are sort of carrying this forward which which finally means and yet we want to provide that access. So somewhere we have to cost effectiveness is, is very critical. So cost effectiveness and environment friendliness should both should yes, be there, right? Yes, yes. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you for the presentation, Professor. Actually, I have one question. You talked about uh, the energy uh, transitions and the renewable uh, picking up in the years, coming years. Uh, and uh, I would like to know the carbon capture part, like say, we are talking about mostly on uh, increasing uh, demand of energy which is coming but we would like to know how uh, the carbon capture is really picking up on this aspect. So carbon capture, the commercial things which are there are typically in the industry, in the petrochemical industry if you look at fertilizers, in the urea manufacture what has been done is um, uh, we have systems where you take the CO2 and then we with uh, with MEA which is uh, we, we just absorb it and then that CO2 is used in the process. So capture there are many different technologies they can be cost effective but 
capture and if you can do capture and utilization still that is a reasonably that can be done reasonably cost effective. But if you are looking at capture and storage then it is a little more challenging. And today it looks like again as I said it, the technology can change but today it looks like renewables and storage may be cheaper than fossil and carbon capture. But uh, we currently do not have enough investments in R&D on carbon capture and storage. Uh, a few years earlier, maybe a decade earlier, this was going neck to neck, but because the PV and renewable prices went down, the thinking today is that it's going to be batteries are going to become extremely cheap. But you know, beyond the point, certain things plateau. So we have to wait and see. Okay. So just uh, because. But in industry, there are many places where you can have cost effective carbon capture utilization. Yeah, so, uh, yeah because I asked, we, uh, we have the option of com coming called to methanol. Yes. Uh, so is it more towards that? As yes, so that, that project is actually planned to look at carbon capture integrated. And because see, we have a lot of coal nationally, we want to use that. So this is, this is the goal of that. Thank you, sir. Yeah, thank sir, you. Last, last question, can I ask? Well, sir. Yeah, one okay. last question, yours last uh, question. Thank you, sir, for your wonderful lecture. My question is that uh, what were the loopholes they could not think of uh, during the major industrial development when they were uh, doing this IC engines, automobiles, and thermal power plants? And uh, how we are taking yes, care You are saying you, we are going back to James Watt and that yeah. industrial revolution that yes, day. Sir, so during, uh, yeah, during the okay. industrial revolution. And how are we taking care of these uh, loopholes uh, while projecting the net uh, zero carbon emission. My, I mean to say what is the proof that after uh, 30 uh, or 40 years we will be… There is no proof. There is no proof. So See, we, we, we always, you know, the point is at a particular point when you started, we always started with the idea that coal, oil, natural gas, they will make, they will make human life better and we started using it. We, the usage and the emissions were very small compared to nature's ability to absorb it. So it did not manifest itself in a, as a problem. When it got to a level where it started disrupting those balances, we then had the IPCC, we defined the problem. So in similar ways when we look at it, we start using more of something, we come up with some other problem, that is how we, we do not completely understand everything that is happening in nature despite whatever we think. And uh, I think there is no, uh, but having said that, I mean, in general, one of the things is now, is it sustainable to have a large 1000 megawatt solar PV play, plant at a particular land space? There are many other issues related to sustainability. So we, we will see that. And then this is always, this has always been a sort of thing where there is a, uh, we go in certain way, there is a dialogue, there is an equilibrium and then we shift and we understand there is a problem and move forward. Thank you, sir. Yeah, so there are some comments uh, in case you want to uh, respond to any of them. One is about the manufacturing processes for uh, low carbon. Oh, what are obstructions, low carbon, and many low carbon technologies? Floating offshore wind farms, what are the obstructions? Uh, oh, 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 with offshore wind farms are challenging, they are costly and um, in places uh, in Europe, etc., where the land, uh, where the space has already been taken up and then offshore. So I think we are exploring, initially we had not even, uh, we had not even mapped this with ONGC and uh, with um, many of the uh, places we, we now have some data and we are going to do a little bit more of it. Uh, in terms of low or uh, have very complex manufacturing, yes, we can actually contribute in terms of R&D for manufacturing. We have a very interesting center of excellence on uh, smart manufacturing and uh, I think we can also look at the entire life cycle of manufacturing and the sourcing of materials. So I think uh, demand flexibility, uh, well demand flexibility in the market, uh, we have a lot of controls for intelligent buildings 
and uh, but uh, I think demand flexibility and the loads that are flexible and studying those loads in the Indian context what happens is there is uh, a lot of this is now about commercial and industrial loads. So, air conditioning loads and flexibility in that and looking at storage may be one option. There is a cost in terms of we have a large number of smaller consumers with small consumption. So, then the cost per consumer. So, it may be different from California in that sense, but uh, you are right that I think flexibility and demand side management do not get the attention it deserves and I think there is much more which can be done in a cost effective way. So, uh, in the interest of uh, uh, time, I would request you to email Professor Banerjee any other questions that you have and then you can carry that conversation forward. Yeah, send mail to Rangan at IIT. So, the email address that uh, he suggests is rangan at the rate IITB. Uh, sorry, iitd.ac.in. <laughs> that was a Freudian slip. So, I request uh, uh, Mrs. Vaishali to uh, come to the uh, dais and uh, present uh, uh, Professor Banerjee with a token of appreciation. Thank you. I will now present the vote of thanks uh, for this program. So, uh, first of all, I would like to uh, express my gratitude to uh, Professor Rangan Banerjee for agreeing to deliver this uh, first lecture in our lecture series. And uh, this is the first time many of us are hearing him speak on a very technical topic uh, for which he is very well known outside. And he has uh, um, very aptly identified what are the drivers and uh, how IIT Delhi ecosystem can contribute to that. So, I am very thankful for, uh, to him for that. Uh, I am of course thankful to <laughs> Mrs. Vaishali, uh, Vaishali Sinha for coming all the way to IIT Delhi to inaugurate this lecture series and giving us her support. She is very passionate about uh, this center and she is one of the big driving forces behind the center's activities and you can tell that she is also very passionate about engaging with students, faculty and especially women. Uh, I would like to thank uh, uh, Professor P. V. Rao, Dean Planning for uh, sparing his valuable time to come and inaugurate this uh, and giving the welcome remarks. I would like to thank uh, Mr. Suman Sina for joining online and uh, presenting his remarks. And finally, thanks to all my colleagues, students, and everybody who joined us for this lecture series. So thank you all. <laughs>